Adolescent psychosocial development is a search for a consistent understanding of oneself. Self-expression and self-concept become increasingly important at puberty. Each young person wants to know, who am I? We begin by looking at identity, then close relationships, sadness and anger during adolescence, and conclude by discussing drug use and abuse. It is a common grumble that children grow up too fast. No more. Teens are in no hurry to embrace the joys of adulthood. The duration of adolescence has lengthened, and identity achievement is more complex. Scientists have announced that adolescence, previously thought to end at 19, now stretches well into the 20s. But according to uh, developmental researchers, there is a lasting gift that extended adolescents can bestow. The brain has more time to fully develop before the individual is plunged into the adult world. Biologically, adolescence serves to prepare the brain for independence, and it represents the last surge of plasticity, when the brain is far more open to change than it was in middle childhood. In particular, the last to develop are the circuits that deal with navigating other people's needs and emotions and connecting immediate actions to long-term consequences. With a longer adolescence, some people have an extra chance to strengthen these human capacities. This concept of extended adolescence is not new. In fact, it was first made famous by psychologist Eric Erickson, who in his theory on, on the different stages of human development term this stage identity versus role confusion. It's the fifth stage of development in which a person tries to figure out, who am I, but is confused as to which of uh, many possible roles to adopt. Erickson explained identity as a consistent definition of oneself as a unique individual in terms of roles, attitudes, beliefs, and aspirations. Identity achievement is Erickson's term for the attainment of identity or the point at which a person understands who he or she is as a unique individual in accord with past experiences and future plans. Adolescence lasts longer than it used to, which means a hormonal 10-year-old and a not yet launched 24-year-old are both well within the range of normal. According to uh, Temple University professor uh, Lawrence Steinberg, whose findings are spelled out in the book Age of Opportunity, Lessons from the New Science of Adolescence, adolescence has been stretched at both ends because of the early onset of puberty and the delayed transition into adulthood. Here are some terms you need to be familiar with as you read and study this chapter. Role confusion or identity diffusion is a situation in which an adolescent does not seem to know or care what his or her identity is. Foreclosure is Erickson's term for premature identity formation, which occurs when an adolescent adopts his or her parents' or society's roles and values wholesale, without questioning or analysis. And moratorium refers to an adolescent's choice of a socially acceptable way to postpone making identity achievement decisions. Uh, going to college is a common example. Erickson highlighted several aspects of identity. First, religious identity. It is influenced by parents and community. Political identity and ethnic identity influenced by parents and culture. Vocational identity. Uh, early vocational identity is no longer considered appropriate. Uh, teenage employment can interfere with school. Teenagers may have several different jobs as well, and it takes years to acquire the skills needed for uh, many careers. And finally, gender identity and sexual identity. Gender identity is a person's acceptance of the roles and behaviors that society associates with the biological categories of male and female. Sexual orientation is a term that refers to whether a person is sexually and romantically attracted to others of the same sex, the opposite sex, or both sexes. A national study of American high school seniors explored the relationship between religion and a broad range of health behaviors among adolescents. The conclusion was that religious involvement encourages or promotes adolescents' involvement in behavior that can protect or enhance their health. 
Although the findings of this study generally support the notion that religion is an important socialization influence, the specific mechanisms through which religious attendance, importance, and denominational affiliation relate to the various adolescent health outcomes have yet to be determined. Further, it's not clear that these mechanisms are necessarily unique to religion per se. Uh, for example, in addition to religion, researchers emphasize the importance of peers, school, community, and other more macro level contexts. Adolescence is a time of exploring beliefs. The different ideological and theological perspectives can spawn doubt in religion. Uh, survey data from religious adolescents revealed identity moratorium, identity achievement, and doctrinal uncertainties are predictors of doubt, while identity foreclosure, identity diffusion, and religious satisfaction are uh, negative predictors or uh, lessen doubt. Identity and depression are related. The search for identity creates vulnerability to depression and anxiety. Fluidity and uncertainty about sex and gender are common during early adolescence, especially for transgender, gay, or lesbian adolescents. Gender dysphoria describes distress at biological gender. Gender dysphoria looks different in different age groups. According to the DSM-5, professionals deciding whether to diagnose gender dysphoria in children, adolescents, and adults should look for the presence of the following symptoms in adolescence. An incongruence between the individual's expressed gender and primary sex characteristics and or secondary sex characteristics lasting for at least six months. A strong desire to be rid of one's primary and or secondary sex characteristics a strong desire for the primary and or secondary sex characteristics of the other gender, a strong desire to be of the other gender or an alternative gender, a strong desire to be treated as the other gender or an alternative gender, and a strong conviction that one has the typical feelings and reactions of the other gender or an alternative gender. Cross-gender behaviors can begin as early as two years old which is the start of the developmental period in which children begin expressing gendered behaviors and interests. Early onset gender dysphoria typically starts in childhood and continues into adolescence and adulthood. Late onset gender dysphoria, on the other hand, occurs around puberty or much later in life. The causes of gender dysphoria are currently unknown, but genes, hormonal influences in the womb and environmental factors are all suspected to be involved. The next section of this lecture looks at close relationships in adolescence. As the adolescent pushes for more individuality and independence, there's usually more conflict from increased differences within the family system. When a young person separates from childhood and enters adolescence, they leave the age of command when they believe parents could make them obey and they enter the age of consent when they now know that compliance with parental rules is entirely up to them. Parent-adolescent conflict typically peaks in early adolescence and is more a sign of attachment than of distance. Uh, bickering involves petty, peevish arguing, uh, usually repeated and ongoing about uh, everyday concerns, and uh, this is not unusual. Avoiding extremes of strictness or leniency provides the best support while teens adapt to increased autonomy. There are four aspects of family closeness. Communication. Do parents and teens talk openly with one another? Support. Do they rely on one another? Connectedness. How emotionally close are they? And control. Do parents encourage or limit adolescent independence? Adolescents are more dependent on their parents if they are female and or from a minority ethnic group. This can be either repressive or healthy, depending on the culture and the specific circumstances. Parental control involves the level and type of parental monitoring. It's a parent's ongoing awareness of what their children are doing, where, and with whom. It can be positive, part of a warm, supportive relationship, or it can be negative, overly restrictive, and controlling, 
the worst type is psychological control when parents make a child feel guilty and impose gratefulness by threatening to withdraw love and support. Cultural expectations for parents of teenagers vary across cultures. Across cultures, parent-child communication and encouragement reduce teenage depression, suicide, and low self-esteem while increasing aspirations and achievements. Expectations, interactions, and behavior vary by and within cultures and within U.S. ethnic groups. Uh, an example is familiarism versus adolescent autonomy. Across cultures, a supportive family environment is key, and that can take different forms. Let's say you're sitting around with uh, some friends playing video games, and someone mentions a particular game that happens to be one of your favorites. Oh, that game's easy, so not worth the time, one of your friends says dismissively. The others agree. Inwardly, you know that it is a game that you happen to enjoy quite a lot, but outwardly, not wanting to debate the issue, you go along with the crowd. That is what is commonly referred to as peer pressure. It's probably more accurate to refer to this as peer influence or social influence uh, in order to be accepted as part of a group of your equals. Peer pressure provides encouragement to conform to one's friends in behavior, dress, and attitude. It is usually considered a negative force, as when adolescent peers encourage one another to defy adult authority. But it can also be a positive influence of either gender. Just as people can influence others to make negative choices, they can also influence them to make positive ones. A teen might join a volunteer project because all of his or her friends are doing it, or get good grades because the social group he or she belongs to thinks getting good grades is important. In fact, friends often encourage each other to study, try out for sports, or follow new artistic interests. Adolescents use social media to strengthen existing friendships. Studies have shown 92% of 13 to 17 year olds go online daily and 24% are online almost constantly. The internet may provide support for non-normative adolescents such as those who lack social skills or lack friendships in their schools. Peer pressure and social media provide an immediacy of peers. These are peers who are nearby at the moment and they are the most influential. The text brings up the concept of deviancy training. This is destructive peer support in which one person shows another how to rebel against authority or resist social norms. A study from the University of Oregon found that when antisocial teenagers interacted closely with each other and spent their time discussing such things as substance abuse and breaking the law, they tended to later engage in more problem behavior. Now, this finding supports the idea that friendships closely bonded over deviant values may heavily influence problem behaviors. Adolescence is a time when romantic relationships may occur. Romantic partners influence each other on a wide variety of things, and they typically first occur in high school. The perception of peer sexual activity is influential. Researchers looked at three different kinds of norms. One was teens' perceptions of what their peers were doing, uh, another was what they thought their peers would approve of, and the third was how much direct peer pressure they felt. Researchers found that perceptions of their peers' activity, even if it wasn't correct, had the greatest influence on teens, followed by their perceptions of what their peers would think. Peer pressure appeared to have the least influence on sexual activity. For 30 years, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey has asked high school students from all over the United States dozens of confidential questions about their behavior. As you can see, about one-fourth of all students have already had sex by the ninth grade, and more than one-third have not yet had sex by their senior year, a group whose ranks have been increasing in recent years. 
Same-sex romance does occur in adolescence. Some cultures accept and others criminalize youth who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. Parental and peer support help, but there is a higher risk of depression and anxiety. Sexual orientation is fluid during adolescence. Sexual orientation can be strong, weak, overt, secret, or unconscious. In one of the uh, discussion questions this week, we explore how adolescents learn about sex. They can learn from the uh, media. Uh, the internet provides information about STIs. Unfortunately, it's often uh, frightening or misleading. Uh, intense exposure to uh, sexually explicit material has been linked to increased sexual activity. Adolescents learn from parents. Parents are the most important influence and parents often underestimate a child's sexual activity and the communications with parents are often incomplete. Adolescents learn about sex from peers. Same-sex friends are the most common confidants. Partners teach each other more about pleasure than consequences. Adolescents also learn from educators. Sex education varies dramatically by school and nation. Sexual abstinence-only approaches um, do extend the average age of beginning sexual activity, but uh, a higher rate of STIs occurs. There is a vocal minority that sometimes blocks evidence-based sex education. Federal support for abstinence until marriage programs has increased sharply. Uh, it did so under the administration of George W. Bush and uh, focus uh, on it uh, continued at uh, a state and local level after he left office. Sex education focused on an abstinence only approach fails in a number of ways. Uh, first, it's increasingly impractical uh, trying to uh, persuade people to remain abstinent until they are married is only getting harder because of social trends. Second, the evidence isn't there that uh, abstinence only education affects outcomes positively. The next section of the lecture looks at sadness and anger, two prominent emotions during this developmental period. The general trend during childhood through adolescence is toward less confidence and higher rates of depression. Some ups and downs are normal during uh, adolescence, but some plunge into major depression. Major depressive disorder involves feelings of deep sadness and hopelessness that disrupt all normal, regular activities. The rate of major depression more than doubles during adolescence, and there is a differential susceptibility. One study found that the short allele of the serotonin transporter promoter gene, 5-HTTLPR, increased the rate of depression among girls everywhere but increased depression among boys only if they lived in low uh, SES communities. And this differential susceptibility is partly genetic. Studies have found there are gender differences in depression. Girls uh, have much higher rates than boys, usually about twice as high. The cause for the gender disparity may be biological, psychological, or social. A cognitive explanation for this gender difference involves rumination. This is repeatedly thinking and talking about past experiences. It can contribute to depression, and rumination is more common in girls. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, suicide is one of the leading causes of death in the United States, second only to accidental deaths among people aged 10 to 24. In adolescence, serious thoughts about killing oneself are frequent, and uh, completed suicides are three times higher uh, in males. Uh, Parasuicide refers to a serious attempt that does not result in death. Depression and parasuicide are more common in girls than in boys, but rates are high even in boys. Uh, there are three reasons to suspect that the rates for boys are underestimated. Boys tend to be less aware of their emotions than girls are. Uh, boys consider it unmanly to try to kill themselves and to fail. And completed suicide is also higher in males uh, than in females. Cluster suicides are several suicides committed by members of a group uh, within a brief period of time. 
while experts generally agree that cluster suicides do occur, uh, there's less clarity about why they occur. Uh, two possible explanations for suicide clusters are that adolescents observe and model each other's suicidal thoughts and behaviors, or that adolescents prone to suicidality may tend to hang around with each other to begin with. One of the most challenging and important developmental tasks of adolescence is individuation. The separation of a teen's identity from that of his or her parents is a necessary process that helps him or her move from the dependence of childhood toward the independence of adulthood. As teens enter the process of individuation, they may at times feel lost, confused, angry, and guilty. They feel themselves changing from the inside out in ways that are out of their control. Uh, for some teens, this simply means their adolescent angst and possibly their level of defiance is a bit exaggerated. This scary process, however, can bring uh, previously dormant issues to the surface, such as a serotonin imbalance and depression, uh, ADHD, past traumas, family conflict, or previously repressed resentments toward other family members. Some teens act out in ways that involve breaking the law. The prevalence and incidence of criminal action is higher in adolescence. Arrests are more likely with boys and youth of minority ethnic groups and low SES families. Moody adolescents could be both uh, depressed and delinquent because externalizing and internalizing behavior are connected during these years. A juvenile delinquent is a person under the age of 18 who breaks the law. A life course persistent offender is a person whose criminal activity typically begins in early adolescence and uh, continues throughout life, also known as a career criminal. A adolescent's limited offender is a person whose criminal activity stops by age 21. There are three signs that predict delinquency. Stubbornness, which can lead to defiance, which can lead to running away. Shoplifting, that can lead to arson and burglary. And bullying, which can lead to assault, rape, and murder. The last section of the lecture looks at drug use and abuse. There are variations in drug use. Most teenagers try psychoactive drugs that activate the brain. The prevalence and incident increase from about ages 10 to 25. The youngest most likely try inhalants. There are cohort differences for every drug. Uh, legalization of marijuana, stores selling electronic cigarettes in many flavors, uh, thousands of deaths from opioids are examples of changes in the uh, psychoactive drug scene over the past few years. U.S. adolescent drug use of synthetic narcotics and prescription drug use and smoking has decreased. However, vaping has increased. Cigarettes, alcohol, and many prescription medicines are just as addictive and damaging as illegal drugs such as cocaine and heroin. Drug use before maturity is particularly likely to harm the body and brain growth. Few adolescents notice harm from drugs as use proceeds to abuse and then to addiction. Individuals who begin using drugs as juveniles are at a greater risk of becoming addicted compared to those who begin drug use as an adult due to the immaturity of the teenage brain particularly that part of the brain that controls impulses. The symptoms of drug addiction include tolerance to a substance, withdrawal episodes, using more drugs for longer periods of time, and problems managing life issues due to the use of a drug. Tobacco slows down growth. It impairs digestion, nutrition, and appetite. It can damage developing lungs, hearts, uh, brains, and uh, reproductive systems. Cigarette smoking during adolescence causes significant health problems among young people, including an increase in the number and severity of respiratory illnesses, decreased physical fitness, and potential effects on lung growth and function. Most importantly, this is when an addiction to smoking takes hold, often lasting into and sometimes throughout adulthood. According to the American Lung Association, among adults who have ever smoked daily, 87% had tried their first cigarette by the time they were 18. 
No one who tries a drug plans to become addicted. Teens may try alcohol because they saw their parents drinking, or they may experiment with marijuana because their friends offered it to them. Some people can have one drink or one hit and stop. It's not as easy for others, especially those who have a family history of addiction. Alcohol is the most frequently abused drug among North American teenagers. Heavy drinking may permanently impair memory and self-control by damaging the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. Adolescents typically deny that they experience any harm or could ever become addicted. Increased binge drinking and substance use disorder is related to parent provision of alcohol to teenagers. According to the Centers for Disease Control, although the purchase of alcohol by persons under the age of 21 is illegal, people aged 12 to 20 drink about 11% of all alcohol consumed in the United States. Alcohol affects a teen's brain differently than it does in adults. Teens' brains are still growing and developing in ways that shape their perceptions of emotions, excitement, danger, and some memories. Heavy alcohol use during this time of brain development could lead to permanent changes. Marijuana seems harmless to many. However, adolescents who regularly smoke marijuana are more likely to drop out of school, become teenage parents, and be unemployed. Habitual use in adolescence is linked to memory, language, proficiency, and motivation deficits. Considering the detrimental effects, of course, developmental psychologists are concerned with ways to prevent drug abuse and what works. But first, let's look at generational forgetting. This is where each new generation forgets what the previous generation learned. As used here, the term refers to knowledge about the harm that drugs can do. What works? Well, the federal government uh, recently evaluated different anti-alcohol, uh, tobacco, and drug messaging. Uh, they found that though widely used, studies prove scare tactics ineffective in substance abuse prevention. Going full-blown scary might work on teens already unlikely to use, but it can lead others to tune out. Some tactics, however, have been found to be effective. A study from Ohio State University found teens were slightly less likely to try pot when ads showed drug-free teens as independent and thinking for themselves. 